Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu and I'm so excited to be talking to my guest this week. In my opinion, he's the GOAT. He is a UFC play-by-play -play commentator, but he's more than that. He's the ultimate company guy. He's a, a Swiss army knife, if you will. He hosts press conferences. He emcees you know, official weigh-ins. He's doing interviews. He's a part of shoulder programming on linear, social, digital for the UFC and ESPN. He is none other than, like I said, the GOAT, John Anik. John, how you doing, my man? Well, thank you, buddy. I, uh, I'll never forget the day I met you and I appreciate the intro very much. And, uh, Hey, they call my number. I got to show up. So obviously over the last 12 or 13 years, they've asked a lot of me in a lot of different capacities. And, uh, I guess when they stop calling your number, you go on to something else, but, um, you know, it's been a memorable 12 years and, and I appreciate the kind words off the top, my man. Well, just referring to when we first met, I actually wanted to bring that up right off the bat because, very few times in this business, in the fight game, in this industry, someone will go out of their way to try and help you. Now, whether that help actually leads to something is a different story. But I remember meeting you face to face and in person, you know, in Las Vegas, UFC 162 fight week. I stopped you in the corridor of the MGM Grand. I kind of introduced myself, you know, what I was doing is very early in my career. I was still getting going and I was trying to figure out what to do. And I was trying to figure out what to do at that time. I was trying to figure out a way of uh, maybe making a play to UFC's coverage in India. And you helped provide some introduction didn't really lead anywhere but I never forget when someone actually goes out of the way and it's not one of those things where oh just hit, here's my email hit me up it, you actually followed through on your promise so I appreciate that um but what I wanted to start with I want to kind of go a little chronologically with you I first became aware of you I think like a lot of people did during your time at ESPN as an anchor with MMA Live. And I remember in the UK, that was kind of like one of the things I watched, you know, on a weekly basis on my lunch break while I was working in a in a cubicle in some some office. Fond memories of your time working on MMA Live? Very much so. And as some of your viewers and listeners may know, that show MMA Live was on ESPN UK well before it was on television in the United States. We were on ESPN.com every week, but it took us forever to get to ESPN2 domestically. So I feel such a genuine kinship with fans in the United Kingdom. And Michael Bisping was one of our early viewers. He hated my guts. I don't know if you've heard that story before, but he absolutely hated me. It's amazing that we're on the terms that we are right now because he could not stand watching me on his goddamn television back in the day. But yes, I mean, that was it was sort of my indoctrination into mixed martial arts. I had covered Elite XC1 in Tunica, Mississippi in 2007 with the Mouthpiece Boxing Show. It was my boxing radio show. So that was really the first time I got to see mixed martial arts live and in person. But that laid the foundation for MMA Live in 2008. And ESPN UK was the first channel that gave us a shot. So it's crazy how many people I hear from that actually ingested that show back in the day and have sort of followed my career to whatever degree since. But yes, I'll always look back upon that show fondly. And I do hope, I mean, perhaps this is uh, a, a reckless ambition of mine, but at some point MMA Live can be re-indoctrinated. It's not as though we're not in bed with ESPN again. So maybe somehow, some way, there is an MMA Live 2.0 in the not too distant future. We'll see. I mean, why not? With what we have with Zoom and technology, no one has to be based in the studio. You can do this, you know, in the comfort of your own home. Why not? Um, before you joined ESPN, was the goal to always carve out a career in combat sports or were you kind of thinking about maybe at that time, at least, getting into one of the other major sports in North America? So I wanted to do play by play. And I do think in general, it's important. And I've learned this as I've gotten older to kind of not just try to be passionate about something or follow something that might be a dream job, but figure out what you're good at and what you're, what you're not good at. And even within a broadcasting realm, I got plenty of weaknesses, right? So I felt like play by play was a pretty good fit for me. I enjoyed doing live events more than I enjoyed doing studio work. <clears throat> so I started to steer my career in that direction. You know, the dream for me was to be a radio guy in Boston, but that was very competitive. You know, it seemed like every Red Sox fan in the world wanted to be on the radio 3 to 6 p.m. in Boston. And I felt like my skill set worked pretty well with a play-by-play -play dynamic. I was not getting a lot of opportunities to call sporting events of any kind at ESPN. I felt like I was more equipped to call football or basketball than martial arts, but I was getting opportunities in boxing on ESPN3.com to call all these fights that were happening in the Philippines. And the only prep you could do was on boxrec.com. 
but I just enjoyed doing the live event. I enjoyed the live nature of it, that anything could happen. And even though we didn't know the contemporaries, this is a live sporting event. So I felt like that was the direction that I should be focused on. I was getting one football game a season at ESPN 2010, 2011. I was covering John Jones and Shogun Hua in Newark, New Jersey in March of 2011. And my now boss, Craig Borsari approached me and he said, Hey, we like your work. We're doubling our schedule next year, essentially from 20 to 40 live events. And we have a play-by-play job for you. Have your agent call me on Monday. I didn't have an agent, but we hired one on Sunday and, uh, the rest is history. Now, had I gotten more football games at ESPN, perhaps the story would be different, but I'm I'm so thankful for that fateful day and that connection with Craig, and uh, here we are. What a sliding doors moment. And, and like you said at the top, 12 years with the UFC, if you could go back in time and speak to yourself back then, would you have said to yourself, oh, you're going to be you know 12 years deep with this company, with this promotion, going to be on ESPN one day, and your role will go well beyond just play-by-play commentary. You'll be doing all these other bits and pieces for the company. Well, I'm happy to get those chances. I'm certainly happy that when Dana White can't be at a press conference and he could choose anybody else in the company to be out there, that he wants me to be out there. Uh, But play-by-play is my craft and will always be my focus, much more so than sit-down one-on-one interviews or anything else, right? That's really what I am most passionate about. And I wouldn't have left ESPN if I didn't think that eventually I could ascend to be the number one guy with the UFC. It certainly happened on a much quicker timeline than I expected. And I'm so thankful for all of those years in Brazil and calling fights that weren't necessarily magnified to the world the way the pay-per-views are. I feel like I was developed the right way by Craig Borsari, Zach Candido, and the and the UFC so that when my number was called for the big shows, I was ready. Um, but other than the Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which is really a challenging night for me to step outside of my fast-paced mindset and skill set to do sort of a subdued like black tie event um play by play is really what i enjoy the most and uh you know i'm hopeful that uh, i can continue to call you know 20 plus live events a year for the combat sports leader yeah of all the other gigs that you do for the company i always find the hosting of the press conference the most uh, interesting to observe because that really is the role of a promoter right? The carnival barker. You're up there on the dais. Yes, you're kind of fielding questions, but then you're ultimately going to be asked about the fights and other things happening in the company and the business. How do you kind of deal with that and kind of step out of just being, like you said, in your comfort zone of being a play-by-play commentator and actually kind of wear that promoter's hat for a few minutes? So I should have expected that you would ask all the good questions. And I had a conversation with UFC President Dana White after that Jorge Masvidal, Kevin Holland situation in Miami, I believe it was, right? You have two guys who are not fighting each other going head to head. And sometimes the media is sort of stroking that a little bit. And Dana put a halt to that, as you may recall. And I said to Dana, I said, I'm thankful it was you up there and not me. And I'm also thankful to have that intel now so that if we do have a situation where Henry Cejudo is going at may Rob Dwalish Willie, I can cut off that noise and know and be convicted in that decision that that's the way you would go. So, yes, you're right. It is a little bit of an interesting navigation for me because there are certain questions promotionally that even if I have answers, your lead play-by-play announcer is not going to be answering that question. So. I learned from Dana. I think that if I had not had that intel, if the Kevin Hall and Jorge Masvidal situation had played out, I probably would have let it go and drawn his ire. So thankfully, he was the man up there on the dais that day, my man. Well, you're looking like you've been doing it for years. You're a pro. And I feel like, you know, everyone's getting a lot more comfortable with you doing the odd press conference here or there for a pay-per-view fight week. The idea of getting comfortable with something new by the UFC is also something that I want to noodle on a little bit with you. For years, it was Goldie and Rogan. And then you came onto the scene and you became part of the commentary team. And and now, now in 2023, there's so many different commentators, play-by-play, color, um, so many different teams and duos and trees videos. Social media is a different place now than it was 12 years ago. But when you first came onto the scene, did you kind of gauge the reaction from the fan base who had perhaps been so used to Goldie and Rogan for so many years? Yeah, there was a lot of shock that first night in Nashville, and perhaps there shouldn't have been with some of the venom that was out there because Dana White had warned me to it called me into his office, said, your haters are going to go through the roof. Even connections you have in the media, those people probably aren't going to like you anymore. Excuse me, because maybe they want this job, you know. So I was a little bit conditioned to it, but man, 
that avalanche of hate that first night in Nashville, Tennessee, I could not believe. And I think a lot of that was just people are reticent to change of any kind. And even in terms of my relationship with Dana White, right? And the UFC executives and our live production team, right? All of those people had been used to hearing one voice for every single UFC live event. So a lot of people had to sort of deal with that change. But for me, I was, I think, hyper-focused on our producers and Dana and executing their vision. And I just felt very comfortable leaning into what I perceive to be my own strengths. And that is not as a lifelong mixed martial arts athlete. I've done seven jujitsu classes in my life. I fucking hated every minute of it. You know what I mean? And unless Craig's telling me to go back, I'm never putting on a gi again. Right. And I'm okay with that, right? Because when, not for nothing, when the fight hits the floor, Dana doesn't want to hear me talking about, you know, a Dars versus an Americana or an Anaconda, right? So I try to stay in my lane and I've done that since that fateful night in, in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I try to embrace the positivity and all the love that is out there. And perhaps I need to do more of that. You know, oftentimes public figures will say, yeah, we just sift through and we focus on the hate when we should just be hyper-focused on the love. Um, but you know, to whatever degree that my public approval rating has improved since that first night in, in, in Nashville, I'm very thankful for it. But, um, you know, you have to, and you know, this as well as anybody, bro, you have to have an open mind and an open ear and an open eye to all of that stuff. Because if you close it all off, then the constructive criticism doesn't get through either. 100%. It's mad to think that you were getting hate in Nashville all those years ago because you're so beloved by the fans, the media, and by your, you know, the, the fighters and everyone in the UFC. And like I said, there's been so many new additions to the commentary you know, team. Um, have you had some of the the newer members of, of the team over the years come up to you for advice? Because I'm sure they probably have gone through the exact same thing that you went through 12 years ago. Yeah, it's a great question. I've talked to a lot of fighters, counseled a lot of fighters, and I do believe that the UFC at some point is going to probably have some sort of media workshop for aspiring UFC broadcasters, of which there are many. You know, if I had one wish, it would be that every fighter that approaches me, I could actually get on TV. And there are certain things I can do for certain fighters, depending on what their overall value might be and what I perceive their skill set to be. But there's so much talent in terms of the MMA analytics, people that are out there, not just fighters, but just all the minds in the space that devote so many hours to watching film and trying to get that message out to the masses. I don't know. For me, it's probably 20 broadcast teams at this point in time. And if I'm being completely truthful with you, there's part of me that would love to have a Joe Buck, Troy Aikman situation where it's me and and if it's Joe Rogan and Daniel Cormier, then we do every single pay-per-view together and that's the team. You know, sometimes going from one to the other is kind of nice for the change up nature of it, but I don't know. I would love to be with my broadcast partners on the road and breaking bread and be in a sort of a cycle where we're all getting better together. And sometimes I think the nature of our sport is such that we're all going in different directions. And then we have 15 minutes in the dressing room. And uh, that's not the reality for a lot of these other broadcast teams that might be in a hotel room together, right? A separate workspace working all week. You know, that's sort of what I crave to just be around my broadcast partners all week. But I love every last one of them. Uh, you know, some nights you might have a team where you might not need much comedy from me and maybe other nights where maybe it's me and my buddy Dominic Cruz where I'm sort of generating the comedy. Every broadcast booth is a different challenge and I embrace them all and I love them all. But there is part of me that would would crave a little bit of a more standard operating procedure when it comes to a broadcast team. And over the years, you've done the trio, you've done the duo. Do you have a preference and what, if you can explain to the viewers and listeners what the, the key differences and challenges are of a two-person team versus a three-person team? So the last time I called a major football game, American football game of any kind was 2015. And in that sport, there's a big delineation between the analyst and the play-by-play -play guy. You know, first and 10 from the Patriots 43, toss out in the flat, four-yard gain, brings up a second and six. That's the play-by-play -play guy. And then the analyst comes in and says whatever the hell he wants to say. In MMA, that line is a little bit blurred. Not to say that an analyst should always be calling out a jab or a left cross, but that line is a little bit blurred and our sport happens so quickly that sometimes there might be an analyst who's giving you the why or the how, and then he feels the need to do play by play because something happens in the striking realm that needs to be addressed at that point in time. 
you know, so in a three man booth, less is needed of me. But again, our pay-per-view dynamic is such that we don't have commercial breaks, except when I open my fat mouth and I try to read those promo spots as quickly as humanly possible. But a three man booth on pay-per-view is a hugely different challenge than a three man booth on ABC. Broad sense, I like a two-man booth for MMA because the sport happens so quickly. And there are certain analysts who, Dominic Cruz and Joe Rogan, are so analytical. And sometimes they like to just take a beat and sit there for 45 seconds or a minute in just what's happening. And when they have Daniel Cormier to their right, they're afforded that opportunity, right? So there are benefits in a three-man booth. A guy like Dominic Cruz can actually sit back and observe. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. Generally speaking, I think for me as a viewer for MMA, I like a two-man booth, but I, I don't believe that that is the majority opinion. It's certainly not the opinion of uh, of my bosses. And, uh, you know, I have to talk less. So I guess I make more money in a three-man booth than a two-man booth. So I guess I'm okay with either. Growing up as a pro wrestling fan and a combat sports fan, I personally always liked a two-man or a two-person booth. But you, Rogan, and DC have really changed my mind. Can you just talk to when you three start to work with each other, when that chemistry started to form, because you guys are the A team when it comes to pay-per-view. And I feel like you guys have created so many incredible moments, not just with your voices, but now with that kind of commentator's camera, some incredible visual moments too. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, I feel like they have elevated me a lot and we try to all elevate each other. I feel like Joe Rogan has never had more fun doing this job than he is having right now. And I hope that I am not putting words in his mouth, but I certainly think he loves the DC dynamic. And I think he enjoys what we've been able to produce as a three man booth. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, for me, it's a little bit weird when it comes to the camera on us. And I know those shots are pretty cool for the fan base. And I know when they play them in house, they get a great reaction. And certainly for me and my brand, in terms of trying to make money, like you're goddamn right, that stuff helps. But at my core, I'm a play-by-play guy that's not trying to be the story, that's constantly trying to make the athletes and the fighters the story. And you can be sure that if there were ever too much focus on that, you know, they wouldn't be afraid to stop those announcer cams, you know. But I love working with those two guys. It does seem as, as though there is an initiative right now to feature those two guys as the analysts on pay-per-view whenever possible. And, uh, you know, humbly, I do think it's a great dynamic with the the – what we've been able to establish. And it was January of 2017 that we first started doing those pay-per-views together. Obviously, Daniel Cormier was smack dab in the middle of his fighting prime during a lot of those early years, but now he is very much available to us. And uh, it's a lot of fun, man. It really is. Uh, you know, I like to say my broadcast partner is more famous than yours when it comes to Joe Rogan, because I've also had the chance over the last six or seven years to see his star power increase. I don't even want to say exponentially because he was a huge f-ing deal when we started working together. Right. But now he is the most listened to man in America. And I don't know if he was that in 2016, maybe he was pretty close, but just to watch him with just so much grace and class handle everything that has come his way. I've had a front row seat for a lot of that. So, uh, it's been really cool. And I hope those guys will, uh, do this job forever and ever because, uh, I'm better when they're there. And, and I guess a benefit of having so many teams now, I guess, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, the travel schedule has definitely changed for you. Because I remember, you know, definitely pre-pandemic, but, you know, a few years back, I was just in awe of how you guys would hit the road so hard. You guys are married, got kids and families and things at home and responsibilities to take care of. And I, as a media member, couldn't ever fathom just being on the road every single weekend, 40 plus weekends of the year. How much has that changed now with so many more teams uh, available and obviously so many events now running out of Las Vegas and the Apex? Well, for me, it doesn't have really much to do with the teams because there still aren't that many more play-by-play guys. There's only three of us that actually do it. But, you know, I've been to Brazil probably 30 times, but, you know, I'm going to the equator in Fortaleza and Uberlandia and all over Brazil because I'm trying to become the number one guy. And it's not to say that if they needed me to go to Brazil six times a year right now that I wouldn't do it. But at that point in time, bro, my kids were a lot younger tunnel vision, like, excuse me, I'm trying to take Goldie's job. Like I'll go ever everywhere, you know, global pandemic or otherwise, you know, thankfully my schedule has become more domestic than international. You know, I went 10 years between calling fights in the UK because our guy, John Gooden is over there. God love him. Right. But it was certainly special for me to get to do a pay-per-view in London, England, you know, and I feel like 
this year, just circumstantially, there's been a lot of international flavor, right? We had Rio and Perth and London back to back to back to begin the year. Got a couple of very talented champions in Australia and New Zealand right now. So that's necessitating a lot of this Australia travel, which obviously compresses the family to whatever degree. Um, But yeah, man, the internationals beat us up and I got to be able to perform. And I just, I don't know, man, I don't know like the way we were going. Like if I wouldn't have hit a burnout period, I get asked a lot about burnout. I don't think I'm there, but for me, I do between 18 and 25 shows a year. And uh, I'm on track to do 21 here in 2023. You know, I'm in a stretch right now with a lot of East Coast shows, which is sort of nice. But when they call my number, uh, it's wheels up. And you know that drill all too well. Yep. How much longer do you feel like you can do this? Um, Are you just in your prime at your peak? Are you still on the way up? Like, where do you kind of assess where you are in your career with the UFC right now? Well, there's two parts of that, right? There's the family and how selfish do I want to be? I've done more than 100 nights a year for 12 years, right? Maybe you think when my oldest gets to high school after 15, 16 years, I could try to have a job. Maybe I'm doing a show from home and I travel to eight or 10 pay-per-views a year, not unlike Joe Rogan. The other part of it is trying to become the absolute best that I can be. And if I say Jim Lampley is the goat when it comes to combat sports play by play for me, you know, can I ever get there in terms of the craft? Like there's still a lot of work to be done. I still have goals to maybe call an NFL football game before all is said and done. So I'm not there yet. We've never had a perfect show. So there's still a lot of professional growth that I feel like I need to experience, but Gosh, I don't know, man. I can't foresee myself doing 100 nights a year, like eight to 10 years down the line, even though that's maybe my own dream or aspiration. Uh, at some point, I got to make the selfless play for my kids and scale back a little bit. And if that means that uh, I'm not going to Vancouver, then uh, then so be it, you know. But in terms of putting a timeline on myself, um, trying to earn every contract, right? I got three years left on this one, and uh, it's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, you mentioned the NFL game as a as a as a dream and a passion of yours to call one day. It's incredible how some of these other sports, the way they're structured, they have a full on off season. They have three, four, five, six months where everyone can go home and hang out and chill and spend time with their friends and family. And then they hit it hard for three or four months of the year. Whereas in MMA and the UFC, it is just every single, it is relentless. And that's just the nature of the beast. That is the fight game. Um, The last time I saw you, John, was in Salt Lake City when Leon Edwards hit that incredible head kick knockout of Kamar Usman. And just to kind of set the stage a little bit, (laughs) working for BT Sport at that time, I'm getting ready to post the Kamar Usman winner's graphic, right? The the fifth round has started. I'm like, all right, well, I can see exactly where this fight is headed. Leon does his thing knocks him out. I'm able to absorb it for about 20 seconds. I look at my colleagues. We all have our, you know, mouths wide open, jaws hitting the floor. And then we realize, oh yes, we have about six hours of incredible work to do to amplify this moment as much as we can on social media. And it was only a few hours later until I was able to actually go back and really hear the call that you guys provided for that moment. And then I remember running into you at the Fighters Hotel and you kind of just said that this is one of the best calls we've ever done. And now that it's been coming up to a year later, when you look back and reflect on that moment, where does that stand in terms of the all-time calls you've made for some of the biggest moments in the UFC? Well, thank you, man. It's nice to have an answer for that question. I would always say, you know, Brisbane, Australia, 2013, if you didn't see the heavyweight fight between Mark Hunt and Antonio Bigfoot Silva, you need to go back and watch that fight. Or Rose Namajunas knocking out Ioana Yeon Jacek the first time those two fought at Madison Square Garden. For me, in a broad sense, every time somebody who is not a UFC champion becomes a UFC champion, those are the greatest moments for me as a UFC fan. And I'm sure you appreciate and agree with a lot of that sentiment, whether it's Brandon Moreno or Jan Bohovic, but Leon Edwards takes the cake for me professionally and in terms of just new champions breaking through the manner in which he did it. The call is certainly secondary to the manner in which he did it. But yes, I mean, I was not aware not unlike yourself, after the fight happened, I had no idea that I had just said that right before he had landed that actual kick. Um, But yeah, I mean, I've said this a lot, but I just felt like at that point in time, this whole moral victory narrative just did not dovetail with who Leon Edwards is or was, and it took him forever to get this fight. 
his whole career, he had just been so criminally underappreciated that no, like this is not the moral victory guy. Like he's not that guy. So when I heard it again, and it wasn't even necessarily one of my broadcast partners who was suggesting it at that point in time, as much as they were just bringing it up that we had talked about it earlier. And it just sort of stuck in me. And I was like, yeah, but like, that's just not the cloth from which this dude is cut and then bang. Right. But it's like Leon Edwards doesn't give a rip about a moral victory. And that's the only point I was trying to make. Got lucky with the timing. And I will tell you, you know, Dana White, it's hard to get his praise. You know, he came up to me on stage at the weigh in in advance of the rematch as the footage was playing. And he was like, dude, that's the best call of your career. And I was like, yeah, you know, you better be lucky and good. And he's like, no, but, you know, you throw enough out there and you hit one like that. And uh, to hear that from the boss was like, uh, meant the world to me. So, uh, yeah, it's cool, man. You know, I'm, I feel forever linked to Leon and happy to, you know, be a, a some small part of a, a memory that he and his family will always enjoy. There were so many incredible moments from that night. The head kick, um, his coach giving him advice in the corner, the, the commentary call. I must have relived that moment and elements of that moment for weeks and months after the, after it had all kind of set. I'm so glad I was there in person. Um, I don't get to travel as much as I used to, but man, I was so happy to be there that night. Um, now, 2015, you and Kenny Florian start your podcast. And so you're about eight years or, or so um, on that run. Can you just let me know and the, and the viewers and the listeners how that came about when you and Kenny decided to, to launch the podcast and what that journey and experience has been like, not for you, but for him as well? So about a year prior, I had the idea and hopefully the greatest living American, Brian Stan, is not uh, listening to Smack Talk with Sandu right now. No, but I was deciding which one of my broadcast partners at the time, Kenny Florian or Brian Stan, did I want to start this podcast with? And, uh, you know, I know we're not in the feelings business, but Ken Flo and I just went way back and I just, you know, I, I don't know. So Kenny and I, I went to him over the course of a year and there were some people even in 2000, late 2014, early 2015, who suggested to us like, oh, dude, there's already too many podcasts, right? Now people look back at our show and say it was one of the first ones in MMA. Now we're eight years in. And uh, I think for us, so much of it was just focused on two words, you know, consistency and content, being there every single Monday, 50 weeks a year, and being focused on the content and not so much focused on marketing or social media or listenership or maybe candidly a lot of the things that we should have hired somebody to uh, to be focused on, right? But for us, seven years in to get a deal from DraftKings to have them essentially purchase the show, we had had a licensing deal with Fox Sports back in the day, but it was just proof that we had done something to our entire staff, you know, and it's not a money grab for me. I can pay my handicapper. I can pay Kemflo. I can pay Ray Longo. I can pay my producer. Just makes me very happy to be able to take care of a staff and uh, nothing changes for us in terms of, you know, people's ability to access the show. It will always be free. It will never be behind a paywall. And I guess for me, it's the best way for me to give back to fans, right? And perhaps that sounds a little bit self-serving as if like, what do you have to give back? But yes, it gives me an outlet to get things off my chest. Certainly after these major pay-per-views, it's nice to be able to sit down and to be able to feel like I can have an outlet and to be able to connect with fans, um, but also to be able to give free content to fans that spend a whole lot of money to be a mixed martial arts fan. And, uh, you know, they'll never pay for our show. And what I love about it is, you guys own this. This is your baby. Like we live in a very volatile, well, we live and work in a very volatile business. We could be, uh, like you said, our number could get called one day and then there's the exit door the next day. That's just the nature of the beast in terms of the industry we work in. But to to build and grow something that is yours 100% is a beautiful thing. I love seeing that, not just from media members, but from fighters. So many fighters have created podcasts and YouTube channels that are successful and, and generating income and revenue. And I love that. Um, how do you manage your professional life with being married and, and having three kids? Um, and I know you touched on that a little bit with the travel schedule, and I'm sure being more domesticated now in terms of the US, that's helped a little bit. But just kind of juggling the two, the work-life balance, how do you deal with that? Well, so you and I go way back, and I'm so happy for your success. And uh, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you, right? But interviews like this, I used to do every interview that would come across, right? Mm -hmm. And I can't do that anymore, right? And that's hard for me to maybe say no to a guy or say, hey, I can do like one a year for you, right? So I'm trying to strike a better balance, and I'm trying to be present when I'm home. But 
it seems as though as my profile has increased to whatever degree that there's just more work that comes with that, whether that's with DraftKings or the video game. And, you know, sometimes what people don't see is maybe me and Daniel Cormier extending a UFC pay-per-view trip, an additional three days on the back end to do some voiceover work. You know, there's just a lot of different components to the job that I love, but it does stress the family. So I don't know that I've struck that balance. I do feel like I'm more present when I'm home and you're obviously springing me here 10 minutes early, right? So that I can go pick up my kids today, which is certainly what I would want to be doing. So you know, the UFC does afford me the opportunity to be home when I'm home, but not a day goes by where I'm not voicing something over or somebody needs something from me. So I don't know that I'll ever wholly strike that work-life balance. I think just the way my brain is wired, it feels like that pendulum has to swing more towards work than towards life and recreation. And I guess I have to sort of come to grips with that at whatever advanced age. But, uh, I do always have in the back of my mind, like, dude, when, when your oldest kid gets to high school, like maybe you could scale back a little bit and actually not miss, you know, every other soccer game. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, I'm in a position to do that in three or four years because we got to provide as well. And as a segue, um, and I know you've basically already addressed this, uh, very well, but the one thing I wanted to ask as a follow-up is when the Colby Covington situation happened, right? Do you internally have a conversation with the brass at the UFC to kind of speak to them in terms of how we're supposed to be dealing with this as, as a company? Because you are a company man. Because w when he said what he said, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it's one thing. First of all, I don't like anything to do with race, religion or family, number one. Number two, you're not a fighter. It's another thing to say that to a potential you know, opponent or when you're trying to build a hype up a fight. But what, where is this leading to? What is this doing for anyone at this stage? So I'm just kind of curious how internally you were dealing with a situation like that. No, and it's a good question. And I did have a conversation with one of my bosses, Zach Candido, about it. And I did feel his support. You know, I think big picture, Colby Covington knew his audience and the UFC knows their audience. And if that audience is me, I'm not really an alarmist, you know, I think Colby felt pretty convicted in what he was saying was not going to have me going looking for a court order in the state of Florida, you know, so I guess it was a little bit shocking to be injected into the promotion of a potential fight or into the division in that sort of way. But I don't know, man, like candidly, I just thought it was Colby Covington in character. That was like my initial reaction. And it was only later in the day that I realized sort of the gravity of it and how maybe injecting someone's kids to that degree is probably not something a fighter should be doing. You know, I first just saw the transcript. Then when I saw the video and saw sort of the venom with which he said it, maybe it was a little bit more off-putting. Uh, but, you know, I think that he is trying to promote. I think he would probably tell you off the record that he crossed the line when it came to uh, threatening that my kids would grow up without a dad. But, uh, I don't know, man, you know, maybe if it was some other fighter, I would have taken it as more of a legitimate threat. But I just I saw this as Colby Covington firmly in character. And uh, I don't know if we're really judging me based upon my initial reaction. Somebody texted me. I looked at my phone. I was like, oh, boy, you know, and uh, I just sort of shrugged it off. And then, you know, there are days in life as a public figure to whatever degree where sometimes you say things and it gets sensationalized or not. And your day just takes on a different tone. That day took on a different tone, but Colby and I have, have, uh, have spoken privately. And, uh, I feel that he respects me enough, uh, despite my public support of Bilal Muhammad. And by the way, I try to support the whole roster, but that's another conversation, but I think Colby respects me enough to call his next fight. And, um, hopefully he'll be there for the fighter meeting as well. God bless. Amen. Um, I didn't know, uh, John, that you had a twin brother until very kind of, I guess, late into just observing you in this kind of UFC journey. Um, I'm just curious because I've got a few friends that are twins. Have you ever done the twin thing like growing up as teenagers, as, as young adults, where you've just kind of like, and I think you know what I mean by the twin thing in terms yeah. of, yeah, have you ever done that? No, I mean, we used to mess with my mom a lot when there was no caller ID. So right. I would call her and start talking trash about myself. 
to get her to take the bait, say something negative about me. And I'd be like, mom, it's me, you know, and she hated that. Right. But no, I mean, like we didn't look that much alike when we were growing up that we could like get girls. Yeah. We could trick teachers, you know, but it's like, do I want to be sitting in his social studies class? Like, okay, (laughs) teacher has no idea. Like I'm going to go take a piss and not come back. Right. We are starting to look more alike as we get older. And if you're around us, our mannerisms are the same. He sometimes says we come across as disingenuous to people because maybe we say the same thing five minutes apart. But no, I mean, I get a lot of looks when I'm with him now because we exceedingly look more like each other than ever before. But no, we didn't mess with people as much as your average twins. Just imagine, though, Chamatkar Sandu, if there was another human being that looked and acted and sounded just like yourself. Like Joe Rogan has seen it all, right? And yet every time he sees my twin brother, like it creeps him out, dude. Like I get it. Like <laughs> twins are creepy. I can get it. <laughs> oh man. Listen, only a couple more things because I want to be very, very respectful of your time. Um, curious to know your thoughts about Francis Ngannou signing with the PFL. Well, I want to see him fight in MMA. So if you're telling me here, I'm talking to my man in May of 2023 and he's not going to fight in the PFL till May of 2024. That's not a win for me as an MMA fan. You know, yeah, we led the Anakin Florian podcast with him signing with the PFL. And I love it for Kenny Florian. who's going to be calling his fights. I like that Francis is going to be making life changing money, which, by the way, he could have realized in the UFC. I like that a principled man is getting his respect. I like the potential of what he can do in Africa. I can't sit here and tell you how his ambassadorship with the PFL in Africa is going to affect change versus Kamaru Usman's already running promotion in Africa. Like, I don't know about all of that. I love Francis Ngannou. I'm very disappointed that I'm not going to be calling his next fight. I'm intrigued that he's going to get a boxing payday. I hope it materializes for him. Uh, and I hope they find some some real good heavyweights for him to fight whenever that PFL MMA debut happens because whether it's on pay-per-view or otherwise, I'll be buying. But candidly, guy. Last fought in MMA January of 2022. I'm not looking for a two and a half year layoff for Ngannou right now in mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. Favorite fight you've witnessed, regardless of whether you were involved in the commentary or not? Nick Diaz, Paul Daly. I would always tell. Oh, I would always tell fans in my ESPN.com chat. May she rest in peace. If you're not an MMA fan, and back then, 2009, 10, 11, I used to hear from a lot of people who weren't MMA fans, and I would just always direct them to watch that one-round fight between Nick Diaz and Paul Daly. Yeah, so I was watching at home. I was not in the building, and uh, all-time great for me, for sure. The travel schedule, tips, advice that you would give anyone, maybe two or three things for anyone that's hitting the road a lot. You've been on the road so much in your entire career. What advice would you give anyone that's traveling around the world? Well, mental health is something that I think plagues a lot of us. And don't beat yourself up too much if you can't get on a great sleep schedule. You'll still be able to perform, you know, uh, however you got to get through that show. If Tylenol is your thing or caffeine is your thing, you'll still be able to get through whatever it is that your initiative is. And I would also say cardio is king for me, certainly on the road. I've done earthing in Australia, which is to say you take off your shoes and actually try to connect with the earth after you've been on a metal tube for 30 hours. So open your mind to things like that. I mean, 22-year-old me, if you would have talked to me about earthing, I would have been really obnoxious with my answer. So I would do anything to try to get over jet lag, but sometimes you just have to mentally resign yourself to the fact that I'm not going to get over this and I might only sleep three hours at the time, but at a time, but I'll get through the show. And uh, yeah, I try to run every day when I get to those foreign countries and it hasn't failed me yet. Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz. Were you surprised that this was the fight Nate Diaz opted for for his boxing debut? And, And how do you think that one plays out? Well, I guess I probably give Nate a better chance than a lot of people do, but I am a Jake Paul supporter, and uh, I think it's a dangerous fight for Nate. I think it's reflected in the betting line. Uh, You know, I'm excited. I'm excited for Nate to get this payday. I think it stands to reason this is a bit bigger payday and a bigger fight than most of the boxing fights that might have been there for Nathan. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see it. I mean, they're certainly going to get my money. I just hope it happens, right? August 5th is a couple months away. I know Platinum Mike Perry is trying to position himself as the backup. Nate's going to be there. And uh, I do think even though there's maybe a size discrepancy and a strength discrepancy, uh, I think Nate Diaz could surprise people. I'm contractually prevented from betting on it, but I think Nate Diaz is a live underdog come August 5th. Mm-hmm. 
Big year for Conor McGregor. He just had his documentary drop on Netflix. I think he'll have a movie coming out with Jake Gyllenhaal, I think towards the end of this year. He's about to be on our screens on a weekly basis over the next couple of months with the return of The Ultimate Fighter. And hopefully he'll be fighting Michael Chandler. You were at his last fight and that also coincided with what I think. I know Bruce Buffer has some of the best suits in the game, but for McGregor Poirier 3, um, man, that suit that you busted out of that pink suit huh. where you had the, the lining with you DC and Rogan just going crazy absolute mint of a suit um just your thoughts about Conor McGregor coming back this year can he still come back can he still do the damn thing and you know how excited are you for the opportunity to call his return fight later on this year Yes, to all of the above, and uh, I, a distant last is me calling the fight. I just want to see Conor McGregor back. You know, I have said in so many interviews over the past several years that the only place for Conor to sort of scratch the competitive itch that he's trying to scratch is the octagon. It's not in bare-knuckle boxing with respect. It's nowhere else. It's not in a boxing ring. And I would softly remind everyone that had he not broken his leg, we probably already would have seen him at least once, if not twice more. Like, I really do believe him at his word when he suggests that he wants to be in an active competition cycle in the UFC. But I, he had to heal, you know, like the man had to heal. So I am cautious in my optimism. But yes, like, I think we get him fourth quarter and Dependent upon results, I think you absolutely get him again first quarter, second quarter, 2024. Uh, I feel like he's chasing further greatness, and I know he has more money than he even ever expected that he would have, but how much is he going to enjoy his retirement if he doesn't get a few more scalps in MMA? I would stand, I would suggest to you not nearly as much as if he can beat a few more of these guys. Heaven forbid chase a world title, you know? So I don't know if if that's on his horizon, but uh, yes, I mean, I think we see him against Michael Chandler in December, and as long as he doesn't break his leg, I think we see him in March 2024 as well. I can't wait. Every time Conor fights, it just, you know, everyone's just lifted up. The whole business is on fire when he's he's returning, and I just can't wait for the ultimate fighter. Like, I haven't seen the show on, on a as an appointment viewing thing for a long time, but this is going to be appointment viewing all summer long. Um, John, I like to end all my interviews and conversations on a bit of a, a light, positive note. It's called The Bit for Social, and for you, one more sleep or you're going to hit the snooze button on a bunch of different topics. All right? So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start with influencer boxing. One more sleep. Is that how we're doing this? That's how we're doing it. That's okay. that's correct. All right. Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz. Oh, one more sleep. I mean, take my money. I mean, I would I would pay for almost anything Nate Diaz put on pay per view. So, yes. Yep. The New England Patriots next season. Well, if Mac Jones is QB1, which it seems as though he is, then we're hitting the snooze button. With all due respect, as I continue to uh, chastise the local franchise, yeah, it's not going to be a good year for the Patriots if he's their QB1. If it's Malik Cunningham, one more sleep. BKFC. One more sleep. I'm in. I'm a believer. You know, I mean, I... Uh, I do believe it's only a handful of fighters, right? The ones with big hands like Platinum Mike Perry. Um, but no, they they intrigue me enough to have my money. One more sleep. Micro betting. Forgive my ignorance. We're going to hit that snooze button. Okay. Francis Ngannou's next fight, whether that be boxing or MMA. One more sleep. He's appointment viewing. He's must-see TV. With respect to the late Anthony Rumble Johnson... Francis Ngannou is the most ferocious power puncher to have ever graced the octagon. I'll be following his every move. And finally, the BMF belt. One more sleep, right? I think it's a good stroke by the UFC. Three weeks before the fight was announced, I had suggested that Poirier Gaethje certainly holds up as a pay-per-view main event. Like, you could do a lot worse than that for a pay-per-view main event. And Salt Lake City's thrilled to have it. Um... I don't know that it needed the BMF belt. I'd like to see the thing get defended by Poirier or Gaethje if Benil Dariush and Oliveira and Makashev do their business, you know. Um, so as long as this thing maybe gets defended at some point in the not-too-distant future, BMF belt, one more sleep. Let's go. I love it. John, you're a man of your word, and I'm also a man of my word. I want to get you out of here because I know you're a, a responsible father and you've got duties to take care of. Thank you so much for coming on the show. 
I am a massive fan. Respect you so much for the journey that you've been on. And I hope this journey continues for years and years and years to come, my friend. Hey, much love. All the pleasures on this side of the table. And maybe we'll have you on the Anakin, Le- Anakin Florian podcast at some point in time. But congrats. I know you're just getting things going. But thank you for having me on one of these first handful of episodes. And uh, look forward to shaking your hand at some point in the not too distant future, brother. Hell yeah. Hope you see you down the road. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.